In the late 17th century, the Irish, Scottish and English elites, while no doubt there were contacts between them at the political and military level, they remained reasonably discreet. One of the great themes of the 18th century is the emergence of a relatively anglicised British elite. There was much intermarriage and certainly a tendency for English heirs to estates to marry wealthy Scots and Irish heiresses. An increasing tendency for them to receive a common education and to embark upon common careers, especially in the military. And so rather than having three or four separate elites, you can see them coming together to fuse, to become uh, a much more coherent ruling order. I think there's also a growing sense of national bombast, national conceit, uh, which is British national bombast and British national conceit as far as some people are concerned. And you can see that in shifts in language, shifts in cartography, shifts in the naming of societies, this emphasis on Britishness. Uh, and, and an early aspect of that is, of course, the creation of the British Museum. Uh, and you get a growing number of these British organisations. Politicians are aware of themselves as running a British empire, maintaining a British army, a British navy, ruling through a British constitution. I think by the early 19th century, we have reached that point where the notion of Britishness has come to serve as a phrase which they use, of which they're conscious. Now, that doesn't mean to say that one, what one may term the sub-national identities, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, England, have disappeared. Far from it. In fact, you can argue very potently that notions of Scottishness and Irishness strengthened during the 18th century, but that almost all Scots and some members, some of the Irish, come to believe that it is within a Britannic state, a Britannic system, a Britannic universe, that their Scottishness can be expressed and developed and strengthened. And to some extent that is true of Ireland as well. Historians always talk about the problems with Ireland. We have to remember that the British government started to rearm the Celtic countries in the late 18th century. The British army was full of Irish. In fact, many of the people who put down the Irish rebellion in 1798 were Irish. So Britishness is establishing itself as a viable political identity and practice and objective to maintain the British Isles, the British Empire and so forth. At just the same moment, when some of the sub-national identities are also strengthening, but coming to accept their existence within a Britannic framework. There were strong dynamics then, particularly at the patrician level of society, that encouraged integration and fostered a shared sense of British identity. The monarch, whose figure had been so divisive for much of the 18th century, had emerged during the wars with revolutionary and Napoleonic France as a unifying symbol of British loyalty. But Britain remained a complex polity. Difference persisted and continued to matter. At times, a loose Protestantism, often pointed to as one of the pillars of British identity, could act as a force for cohesion. But at other times, the divides between Protestant denominations seem far worse. The church most vigorously persecuted in Britain was not the Catholic, but the Episcopalian Protestant church in Scotland, effectively broken by the persecution unleashed against it by the Whig regime in London. <laughs> 
especially further down the social scale. A distinct sense of national difference persisted. Scots were renowned in London for their tendency to cluster together, to favour each other in business, essentially to look out for each other, so too the Welsh. And a sense of being surrounded and to some extent overwhelmed by the English was present in both Scots and Welsh culture. Well, I think the idea of inventing and resisting Britain um, has been explored by several historians that there, there are those in Scotland um, and those in Wales who see a British Union as offering a broader arena, offering opportunities um, either to uh, safeguard Protestantism um, or provide greater economic opportunities for economic development. But there were always elements um, in Scotland and, and I think in Wales as well that resisted uh, the idea of Britain as out of a belief that intrinsically it, it would involve greater domination by English interests um, over what could be seen as peripheral regions within a British island. I think that again is something that emerges or develops over the course of the 18th century as financial power, uh, political power, social change gathers pace in the southeast of the island of Britain and that accentuates uh, these changes. For a long time, historians have tended to assume that the lower orders of society, lacking the sophistication and cosmopolitan inclinations of their superiors, were more responsive to stereotype and crew prejudice and easily roused by nationalist tub thumpers. Recent research, however, reveals that we should be more wary about making such generalizations. Even when their countries were at war, English and French fishermen could set aside questions of nationality in pursuit of a shared interest. Fishing communities in places like Harwich and Dunkirk negotiated their own peace treaties to protect their boats from warships and privateers and then lobbied their respective governments for their enactment. What's perhaps even more interesting is that whilst the commonality with their fellow fishermen might be stressed when negotiating these cross-channel treaties, they might also then employ patriotic rhetoric when dealing with the agents of the state, making much of their contribution to the wider public good. Rather than being simply imprisoned by the shackles of national hatred, the people of the 18th century, even towards the bottom of the social scale, were able to negotiate multiple identities in the pursuit of their own interests. They inhabited a complex world of belonging, in which a national identity was one among many. The metaphor I used when I wrote Britons, and it was a metaphor that I borrowed from Eric Hobsbawm, was that identities are not like hats. You can wear several at a time, and most of us do, in fact, even though we may not necessarily work it out or put that into words. In some cases, I think a growing sense of Britishness could crowd out other identities or put pressure on them. But if you look at people's writings and their behavior in different contexts, you often find that they're drawing on different identities at different times. It has been argued that the main unit of belonging for most people in the 18th century and in fact well into the 19th, was not the nation but the parish. Despite increasing urbanisation and developments in communication and mobility, most of the population still lived, by today's standards, in relatively isolated rural communities. The word foreigner itself was most frequently used to describe someone, not from another country, but from outside the local area. 
far from documenting the steady, growing awareness of a collective class consciousness. Records reveal a frequent resistance to outsiders, the fierce protection of local rights, and village rivalries at times escalating into open violence. Emerging ideas of Britishness and of a wider national identity would have remained largely irrelevant in the everyday life of communities divided not by national borders, but by village boundaries. Perhaps during the 19th century, Britain's expanding empire would provide the wider context in which the British could overcome their own internal differences and embrace an inclusive imperial identity. <laughs>